take over. Dong Dong is currently uh, the faculty member at uh, the Center for Power Electronic Systems at the ECE at uh, Virginia Tech University. Before joining Virginia Tech in 2018, he worked at GE Research Center for various high frequency power conversion technology developments. Currently at CPES, his research focuses on modular based high frequency power electronics technologies for transportation and grid applications. Uh, driving, protection and sensing circuits for wideband gap devices, high frequency transformers, and high voltage insulation systems. He has received multiple IEEE prize paper awards and several new technology and pat patent innovation awards from GE. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Dong. Okay, thank you, Rogelio, uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, can you guys uh, hear me well? Yep, you're coming through loud and clear. Okay, great. So I, I'm gonna just uh, play this uh, uh, pre-recorded uh, presentation. And after this uh, presentation, I'm, I'm very happy to take the questions uh, from you guys. So let's just start it now. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining the Power America webinar today and listening. Uh, Dong, the uh, audio stopped for some audio. reason. Let me see. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining the Power America webinar today and listening to my presentation. Before I start, I wish you and your family members are safe and healthy. My name is Dong Dong, currently a assistant professor at CPAS Virginia Tech. My research interests are the wideband gap power semiconductor based high frequency power electronic circuit and the component design, high power converter for grid, renewable, and transportation applications. Today, I'd like to give you guys an overview of a project funded by Power America on the topic of high density bidirectional DC DC converter for battery charging applications. We'd like to provide not only the project work, but also some of the research results developed from the program. Battery-based energy storage system is a very hot topic and is becoming a very big market in the energy and the transportation sectors. Especially the fast adoption of electric vehicles accelerate the technology development on the lithium-ion batteries so that the battery kilowatt per dollar power and energy density has been improved significantly so the battery system is penetrating into utility energy storage electric aircraft, ships, and behind-the-meter commercial and residential applications. Meanwhile, the battery charging system, in particular the high-power isolated DC-DC or AC-DC converters, gain a strong attention in the power electronic society. Power density and efficiency, as well as the bidirectional power flow capability are the key design metrics. Meanwhile, the converters are moving from low voltage to high voltage, such as 800 volts or even 1000 volt class. There are many topology and variations in the isolated DC-DC space. The very popular solution for high-power unidirectional system are the phase shift full bridge or half bridge converter with different type of rated fire variations and the resonant type converter like LLC. For the bidirectional system, the dual active bridge and the CILC resonant converters are the corresponding two popular options. In today's presentation, we will focus on the CILC resonant converter as it achieves a full range source switching for lower switching loss and simple power stage design, small circulating current or reactive current for lower conduction losses, lower current harmonics in the transformer and lower EMI emissions. In terms of the converter solution, the first question is that, can we simply put a single stage CLC converter to interface the battery with a voltage variation? If you refer to the typical LLC converter design process for power supply, the popular one is the FHA-based gain curve design, as shown in the right-hand side. The equivalent circuit model is shown in the bottom. You can simply vary the operating frequency to adjust the voltage ratio delivered by this LLC converter. Definitely, the loading condition will drive the selection of the operating frequency. For large power range and the voltage range, we need to put a large high-frequency AC inductor 
and uh, operate in a wide, very wide frequency range. Let's put the design complexity of the variable frequency transformer aside. The big issue of the typical ILC design approach is that the FHA-based gain curve design is basically obtained by assuming a pure resistive load, RE. And this RE can represent the charging power. However, in the real battery system, battery behaves more like a voltage source rather than a pure resistor. So the gain curve will now predict very well with the real battery charging operation. To look at the behavior of the battery charging system using a single stage LC or CLC converter, we will build a circuit simulation with a 700 volts battery modeled by an ideal voltage source in series with a small resistance representing the internal battery resistivities. We vary the operating frequency around the resonant point, which is uh, 500 kHz in this particular case. We like to see the converter output voltage and the current regulation in terms of the variable frequency control. We also change the battery internal resistance from 2.5 ohms all the way to 0.1 ohms and like to see how the battery model can affect the CLC converter operations. Here are the results shown by the 3D plots. The vertical axis shows the battery side current representing the charging power level. The X and the Y axis are the normalized switching frequency and the converter output voltage, which is also the battery voltage. The first takeaway we can find is that the converter behaviors controlled by this uh, variable frequency are very different and their different battery internal resistance, which cannot be predicted by the FHA-based gain curve design process. The second uh, takeaway is that if the battery has a smaller internal resistance, the charging power at the lower battery voltage can vary a lot. In this case, from zero all the way to a couple hundred amps in the very smaller operating frequency range. It means the frequency control is very hard to design for the charging power regulation. Also, at the higher battery voltage range, the converter cannot deliver enough output current, even if you operate in a very large range of the switching frequency. So these behavior are very nonlinear. And the role of this uh, battery internal resistance will make this single stage variable frequency control based LC converter very difficult to design and operate. In the long life operation, battery internal resistance can vary over time, making the control even more difficult. Although we can add a large DC inductor between the LC converter and the battery to help stabilize the control stability from snow st signal standpoint, the single stage solution is deemed hard to design and adapt to different battery systems. As we just discussed, the single-stage CLC converter with a variable frequency control is difficult to interface with a battery that has a small internal resistance. We need to explore other options. The straightforward option shown on the left-hand left, left side is to stack a second-stage bulk converter. The big benefit is that it offers a very large voltage regulation range from zero to full DC link. And the control is simple by adjusting the duty cycle. However, all the power has to run through the bulk converter, leading to lower efficiency. Also, this bulk converter will create a large full power DC inductor and a large EMI noises. Therefore, another option is to adopt the so-called partial power processing solution. In this case, we only build up a low voltage regulation stage with the output of VPP and connect it in series with CLC output VMP. In this way, we can let majority power PMP go through the single stage CLC converter, leading to higher efficiency. Only a small power PPP will pass through the two stages partial power branch, but the converter will be a low voltage design with a small DC inductor. The partial power branch voltage and the power readings will be smaller if the battery voltage variation range is small. So this partial power design can be applied to the battery with a voltage variation less than 40% around the average value. For both solutions, the CLC converter operates at a fixed frequency at the resonant point. No AC inductors are needed and almost zero circulating current. This will make the transformer very small and efficient. We just said if the battery voltage variation is less than 40% or smaller, the partial power solution can offer better efficiency, density, and cost benefits. 
Fortunately, many battery system applications fit this condition. This page shows three examples. The first one is the Tesla Model S battery pack. Its voltage range is from 315 volts to 400 volts. The second case is the home battery system for residential and commercial applications. The voltage range is from 350 to 450 volts. The third example is the utility energy storage racks and the voltage range is from 714 to 1000 volts. In all cases, the battery variation is less than plus minus 15% around the average value. This indicates a strong benefit of using the partial power solution. Later, we will show you a design example of partial power solution for 18 kilowatts battery system. There are two ways to control the CLLC resonant converter. The first way and also a traditional way is to operate it as an LLC converter. Therefore, the receiving side is treated as SR rectifiers. It's simple, but actual DCD circuit is needed and it's hard to operate at the bidirectional mode as the control need to, needs to swap the gating functions when power flips the direction. Another way to control the CLLC converter is to apply exactly the same signals on two sides. We name it as the dual active synchronization control method. Such method is very simple and no additional sensors are needed and can operate under bidirectional condition naturally. However, the ZVN source switching of all switches are not the same as LLC converter. So the question here is how can we maintain ZVS on all switches and various power conditions? So this page shows a simplified CLC resonant converter. We replaced the high frequency transformer by three inductors. They are the magnetizing inductor in the middle and two leakage inductors on two sides. And on the right hand side, it shows the key waveforms in one switching period. The top waveform is the voltage measured across the device drain source terminal. And the bottom one shows the three currents measured on the three inductors. So during the T0 to T1 period, most of the power is transferred from sending to the receiving side. And from T1 to T2, that's the short daytime period. We want to make all the devices finish the voltage transition and achieve the ZVS. Ideally, we like ZVS happen on all switches on both sides. The voltage transition during the daytime is mostly driven by the three current shown in the bottom. So now let me show you two non-ideal voltage transition results during the daytime. At the very beginning of the daytime, if assume two currents that flow through the leakage inductors share the same direction and is from the left hand side to the right hand side, according to the device voltage transition operation principle in the phase lag, the left hand side two devices will start a voltage transition immediately as the current is flowing out of the phase lag. However, at that moment, because the right hand side current is flowing into the phase lag, the device will be clamped by the anti parallel body dials and cannot start the voltage transition process. Then, daytime losses are created on that phase lag until the right hand side current flips the direction at the TA moment. Then, let me show you another example. If two leakage currents now flows from the right hand side to the left hand side, then the right hand side devices can start a voltage transition at the very beginning of the daytime, but the left hand side devices will be clamped by the body dials, therefore daytime losses are created. This operation stops until the left hand side current flips the direction at the TA moment. So both cases are now considered as the optimal voltage transition operations. The conclusion here is, at the beginning of the daytime, if the currents on both sides of the transformer are in the same direction, either positive or negative, you will now achieve the optimal device voltage transition because additional daytime losses are generated. In addition, it potentially can create partial ZVS that produce more switching losses and EMI issues. Also, large current readings might happen during the daytime. So with the previous discussion, we learned that if we want to minimize the daytime loss, we have to start device voltage transition at the same time on both sides. Therefore, we need to meet the first design criteria. At the very beginning of the daytime, the currents on two sides of the leakage inductors have to be in the opposite direction, and both have to flow into the magnetizing inductor. With that, we can start the device voltage transition at the same time without additional daytime loss. 
Then to achieve the optimal switch voltage transition, we have to make the devices on two sides finish the transition process at the same time at T2 moment. Otherwise, additional daytime losses will be created toward the end of the daytime. To achieve this goal during the entire daytime period, the ratio of the total discharge energies delivered by the two leakage inductors should follow the ratio of the device output capacitance from two sides. Then, it comes with the second design criteria. By meeting these two design criteria, it will make the device start and finish the voltage transition at the same time, thereby achieving the optimal voltage transition process and the ZVS for all the switching devices. However, the key point that I want to mention here is, this design process has to be tuned at the full load condition rather than the light load case, because at the full load, the current that flows on both sides of the leakage inductors during the daytime can reach the maximum level. This large current can change the current direction on both sides. So the switching frequency and daytime need to be tuned at the full load condition in order to achieve ZVS over the entire power range. This is very different from the traditional LLC converter design, as the energy that is used to discharge the switch output capacitance is from the magnetizing inductor, regardless of the power level. However, in the CLC converter, the ZVS operation is determined by the leakage inductor current, which is highly related to the power level. Due to the limited time, I cannot dive into the details of the optimal device voltage transition discussion, like showing the detailed circuit analysis, models, and equations. So here I just like to show you the high-level simulation and experimental results comparison between the non-optimal and optimal device voltage transition performance. On the left-hand side, it shows the bad design. You can see the device voltage on the bottom, that the devices on two sides didn't start and finish the voltage transition at the same time. Therefore, additional daytime losses are created. The current also shows large readings during the daytime period. In addition, there are high frequency voltage readings created on top of the devices, leading to high EMI noises and voltage stress. However, on the right hand side, it shows the optimal device voltage transition performance during the daytime. Both devices on two sides start and finish the process at the same moments. Therefore, no daytime losses are generated. The minimum voltage second is applied to the transformer leakage inductors during the daytime, leading to small current readings. ZVS are achieved on all the devices with very small voltage readings. Now I'd like to show an 18 kW battery charger system using the partial power solution. This is a project funded by Power America and the Budget Period 5 series. The industry collaborator is UTRC and a carrier. The application is for hybrid electric propulsion system or all electric transportation refrigeration unit. The specification are shown on the right. The power rating is 18 kilowatts. We chose 500 kilohertz to explore the high frequency transformer design boundaries and limitations. The battery range is from 314 volts to 450 volts, with 375 volts to be the average value. The input voltage is fixed at 750 volts. The proposed solution contains two DC transformers. They are the high voltage DCX and the low voltage DCS shown in the blue. And the one regulator is behind the low voltage DCS shown in the yellow. The core concept of the partial power processing is pushing majority power through the single stage high voltage DCX and only the partial power will go through the low voltage DCS, which is actually the CLC converter to regulate the output voltage and control the power flow. There are four candidates for DC regulator in the low voltage partial power branch. Bar converter on the top left, full bridge on the top right, model phase interleaved buck on the lower left, and flank capacitor three level DC DC converter on the lower right. Buck converter can be seen as a benchmark because other candidates have four devices, so to be fair, two devices are parallel in the buck converter. Compared with the buck, full bridge can provide negative output, so it can reduce the a partial power branch voltage requirement by half, which means lower voltage device can be selected. As for the flying capacitor converter, low voltage device also can be used because device voltage rating in a flying capacitor converter is half compared with the buck. 
As for the bug or multi-phase interleaved bug, higher voltage devices should be used. Among these candidates, bug, multi-phase bug, or flank pass-through can only provide passive voltage, but the full bridge can provide negative output voltage range. Therefore, the topology selection will also influence the turn ratio in the transformer design. As shown on the top left, the input voltage is a constant at 750 volts, and two design cases are shown on the right. A full bridge is adopted as a DC DC regulator. VDCMV and VDCLV can be set as a 375 volts and 75 volts. The corresponding turns ratio of the transformer can be determined. If the multi phase interleaved buck or flank capacitor is adopted, VDCMV and the VDCLV should be set as a 300 volts and 150 volts because these topologies can only provide a positive output voltage. Regulator loss at the full power with different topologies is shown on the bottom left. Around the battery nominal voltage, full bridge has the lowest losses because it can reduce the partial power branch voltage rating to 75 volts, leading to smaller switching losses. Also close to zero power delivered where the partial power branch around the nominal battery voltage. On the top right shows the RMS current which goes through the LV partial power branch transformer at the full power condition. Full bridge based regulator has the lowest RMS current, which means the losses on the transformer in the low voltage partial power branch will be also reduced. The bottom right shows the power distribution between the partial power branch over the entire power delivered from the input to the battery. In average, full bridge also shows the smallest partial power over the entire voltage operation range. Therefore, the bottom left shows the total loss from the entire partial power branch at the full power condition. Full bridge regulator in average shows the lowest losses leading to the best design option. Thus, the turn ratio has been selected to 10 to 5 and 10 to 1 for both the major power branch and the partial power branch. According to the discussion, the full bridge converter with 75 volts DC link is chosen as a partial power branch regulator. To further simplify the system, the full bridge with asymmetrical operation is adopted here. The converter has one leg operating in the highest switching frequency for the regulation purpose. In this case, is the S3 and the S4 switches. And another leg, for instance, the S1 and S2 switches, is used to change the output polarity. To improve the efficiency further, the switching leg can be built by parallel interleaving. The regulator loss with different phase numbers is shown on the bottom left. Considering the trade-off between efficiency and power density, three-phase interleaving is uh, selected. For the lag used for polarity switch, S1 and S2, can be changed to just the ultra-low RDS on silicon MOSFET. Because their speed are very slow, so basically these two switches operate like a relay. Furthermore, each phase lag can be designed as a small module because the low-voltage GAN device has been used, which will make the assembling easier. This page shows the final converter design and device selection. On the input side, 1.2 kV thin copper MOSFETs are used to construct the sending side full bridges. Each switching position has two devices in parallel. To simplify the design, two non-magnetic coupled transformers are designed and built for the main power transfer pass and the low voltage partial power transfer pass. For the main power transfer pass, the turn ratio of the transformer is 2 to 1 so that the output voltage is 375 volts, exactly half of the input. And the main power receiving side adopts the 650 volts gamma nitride FETs to handle the large current for devices are put in parallel. For the low voltage partial power branch, a small 10 to 1 transformer is built, delivering 750, uh, 75 volts to the receiving side, followed by the full bridge regulator. So the regulator can provide plus minus 75 volts, making the entire converter output running from 300 all the way to 450 volts. The low voltage regulator operates at 200 kilohertz with a three phase interleaving as discussed before. This will make the DC inductor extremely small. Two CLC converters operate at the fixed frequency 500 kilohertz and the entire converter, including the cooling system, is designed to fit the 1U profile standard.
In terms of the PCB design, the receiving side on the main power transfer path is the key design focus, as it needs to handle a large AC 500 kHz current, and it needs to facilitate 16 GAN devices with a good current sharing and small thermal stress. To reduce the loop inductance and reduce the current crawling, a two-dimensional flux cancellation layout is proposed in the multi-layer PCB design. The top view of the layout is shown on the right, and each switching position has four GAN devices in parallel. This full bridge is composed of two half bridge HB1 and HB2, and their cross sections are shown on the left. If we start at the SWA, current will go up and then turn left into the high side of HB1 via the top and mid three layers. And then the current will enter the DC bus via the mid one and mid four layers. Next, current will come out from the DC minus and go into the lower side of the HB2 via the mid one and mid four layer. Finally, current will come out from the low side of the HB2 and go into the SWB via the mid two and the bottom layer. If you pay attention to the current direction between the adjacent layers, their directions are opposite at both X and Y directions. Therefore, this layout utilizes two direction flux cancellation to significantly reduce the loop inductances. The real PCB board for the high voltage DCS power is also shown on the left. Four GAN devices are paralleled for each switching position. Finally, the Q3D simulation result shows the AC loop inductance is controlled within 5 nanohenry and the current sharing between different layers is good. This page shows the converter testing at the full rated power condition, which is 18 kilowatts. As the receiving side handles the large AC current, the thermal image on the receiving PCB boards with the GAN devices is displayed here, together with the steady state operation waveform of the 500 kilohertz transformer and output voltages from the CLC converters. The device's case temperature is controlled at 42 degrees C, heatsink and fan won't exceed 40 degrees C. This shows excessive thermal design margin, indicating further heatsink size reduction opportunities. It should be noted that RDSR of the GAN device is very sensitive with the temperature, so a good thermal performance can also improve the total efficiency. The dynamic testing results under the 16 kW condition is shown in these slides. The battery output voltage is shown in yellow and the current that goes through the main power transfer pass and the low voltage partial power transfer pass are shown in green and red. As the duty cycle changes from 100% to 25%, the output voltage shown in yellow changes from 450 volts to 390 volts. And then the three detailed waveforms for the uh, the RMV, RLV are shown at the bottom. With higher output voltage, the current RMV keeps nearly constant to, to transfer the majority power, and the RLV will increase to transfer more partial power. The steady state testing results are shown in this page. As shown on the left hand side, the duty cycle from the partial power branch is around zero. So all the power is transferred from the input to output via the single stage CLC converter in the main power transfer pass. And the output voltage is around 375 volts. As shown on the right hand side, when the duty cycle changes to 50%, the output increases to 413 volts and about two kilowatts power is transferred through the partial power branch. This page shows the steady state testing results with 75% and 100% duty cycle provided by the partial power branch voltage regulator. The corresponding output voltages are 431 volts and 450 volts. In the test, a converter was tested up to 23 kilowatts peak power. The total power conversion efficiency is shown on the left hand side in this page. When the output voltage is 375 volts, we reach the peak efficiency around 98.8% because all the power is transferred from input to output via the single stage CLC DC DC converter. As the output voltage increases from 375 volts to 450 volts, the partial power becomes larger and causes lower efficiency. And then the loss breakdown with different output voltage at rated power is shown on the right hand side. 
The total loss is divided into three main components. They are the losses from the main power transfer loop, losses from the partial power uh, branch, and the loss from the transformers. Now let's switch the gear and talk about the high frequency transformer design for this uh, CLC converter. A CLC resonant converter is characterized by fixed unit gain with its input and output voltage relationship only being controlled by the turns ratio of the transformer. In order to reduce the gain variation around the resonant frequency, it's important to have a large ratio between your magnetizing inductance and the leakage inductance. But since the magnetizing inductance must be set to a certain value to achieve the ZVS, the leakage inductance should be minimized. Minimizing leakage inductance also has the added benefit of reducing the amount of processed ready power, increasing the converter efficiency. To reduce the leakage inductance, we use the technique called interleaving or winding arrangement to improve the flux coupling between the primary and the secondary side of the windings. We follow the typical electromagnetic design process for the transformer, sweeping cross-section area, turns ratio, and so forth, and sought the highest efficiency and the highest power density design. One thing to note is that in our design process, we did favor designs with less core loss just because of the thermal challenges associated with the low surface area planar transformers. This page shows the transformer for the main power transfer pass of which the number of turns are 8 for the primary side and 4 for the secondary side. The same leads wire are used for both sides to reach the best fitting factor. This 18 kW transformer has a size profile similar to a deck of cards, achieving 99.6% efficiency. 770 nano Henry leakage inductance refer to the primary side. The winding structure is shown in the bottom right, four totally interleaved layers with two parallel sec secondaries, S1 and S2, to handle 56 amps, 500 kilohertz AC current. As we parallel the two lead wires, S1 and S2, on the secondary to handle the current, the current sharing issues become prominent when it comes to very high frequency operation. Any small leakage inductance difference between S1 and S2 will result in a large unbalanced current sharing or so-called circulating current. Obviously, when we apply the best interleaving structure to reduce the total leakage inductance, we suffer the current sharing issues due to the asymmetry of the parallel secondaries. In our design, we observed over 50% unbalanced current sharing. Some other methods in the literature to improve current sharing are by fire winding, where parallel secondaries are twisted together but doing so results in the total height of the our winding bundle increasing, which not only impact our total high profile, but interfere with our air gap, which was specifically designed to achieve ZVS, so by far winding is not desirable. External balancing transformers have also been used in the literature, but that doesn't make sense to use in a high density transformer design, since it's basically adding an external transformer, which compromises the power density. So if we want to improve current sharing, it comes at expense of either power density, leakage inductance, or losses. For instance, as shown in the bottom, we make a change of the winding arrangement by putting the two secondary side winding on top and bottom layers. This results in a symmetrical arrangement and helps balance the current sharing. But the total leakage inductance is almost doubled compared to the original design. In order to improve current sharing without compromising on loss, leakage, or density, we propose the new winding strategy for these wire transformers called intraleaving. We call this intraleaving because in our proposed winding structure, winding layers can be non-homogeneous, meaning that a layer of secondary can have all your secondary windings in it, as opposed to only one in, as in the original interleaving structure. Let's look at an example. Shown on the slide is our interleaved structure with homogeneous parallel secondary layers. S1 only has S1 winding, and S2 only has S2 winding. To improve car sharing, we transpose two turns of S1 and S2, resulting in the non-homogeneous structure shown on the right. By doing this, we can improve the symmetry 
of the secondary windings in relation to the primary side and greatly improve current sharing. On the far right of the screen, we are showing how the parallel windings are crossed in space to achieve this structure. Current sharing simulation results are shown on the bottom with the old design with normal interleaving on the left hand side and the new design with our interleaving on the right hand side. Car sharing error was reduced from 50% to 5% with the new structure, which is a 10x reduction. Simulation results also show similar loss and leakage inductance between the interleaved and the interleaved structure. In summary, we show a new winding method for this wire called interleaving, which improved current sharing without compromising on leakage or losses. In addition to the insulation voltage, SOMO is another design challenge for high-frequency, high-power transformer design. Particularly, the SOMO challenge is more severe on the windings in the high-power applications as the winding carries high current. In this example, we are designing a 2 to 1 ratio 500 kHz, 18 kW air-cooled transformer with 750 volts as the input voltage. If we fabricated the transformer by following the best interleaving electromagnetic design configuration, it can be found that the winding inner layer temperature can go beyond 180C, which is over 50 degrees higher than the outer surface of the these wire bundles. This is due to the stagnated air pocket trapped inside the these wire. Such stagnated air creates a thermal insulation layer, which causes over temperature and even the thermal runaway problems on the windings. To address the least wire over temperature issue, parting plus forced convection cooling can be considered as a cost effective solution for the high frequency transformer. Epoxy materials are popular for thermal spreading. It has the balanced thermal, curing, and viscosity properties compared with other options like thermal grease and elastomers. Epoxy can be mixed with inorganic filler or powder materials to boost the key value for better thermal performance. But it needs to check the change on the breakdown strength, viscosity change, and the curing conditions. Therefore, this page shows a part of the winding by using epoxy as a parting materials. The parting is only applied to the windings to simplify the parting process. As such, all the air can be pushed out of the lead wire bundle. This page shows the thermal characterization of this parted lead wire based 500 kHz transformer running at 18 kW power. Thermal couples are embedded inside the transformer to measure the temperature. A 24 watt 120 mm high speed fan is put on the side to create a forced convention cooling condition. Due to the epoxy, the maximum winding temperature drops to 126 degree, and the delta T between the inner layer and the surface of the winding is only about 20 C. So it shows a good thermal performance, but it needs a large fan on the side. In order to further optimize the cooling performance, we need to find a way to reduce the fan and optimize the airflow condition. In order to further improve the cooling performance, we can take a look at the airflow velocity around the winding surface and see if we fully utilize the airflow for heat transfer. As soon as the air hit the boundary of the winding, the air molecule near the object are disturbed and move around the winding. Aerodynamic forces are then generated between the air fluid and the object. The magnitude of these forces depend on the shape of the winding. The disturbed air molecules around the front surface of the winding will in turn slow down the flow just above them. This creates a thin layer of air fluid in which the velocity changes from free stream to zero. This layer is called boundary layer. Within the boundary layer, the thermal transfer performance is little affected by the fan. Therefore, a good aero design will push the boundary layer very close to the surface of the winding to better exchange the heat flux from the winding to the airstream. The simulation result clearly shows a boundary layer formation in the design. Therefore, cooling duct with a turbulator design for better aerodynamic performance is very critical to improve the thermal performance. The goal here is to leverage all the air stream and mobilize the air molecules on the surface of winding as much as possible. The cooling duct design needs to consider overall layout, winding size, and positions in order to guide air stream. 
The tabulator plates on the inner surface of the cooling duct are used to break the boundary layer and push the air stream stick to the surface of the winding as much as possible. They also create a tubular airflow around the winding surface. With such design, multiple transformers can be put side by side with a good thermal performance. The detailed cooling duct and tabulator design are now shown here, but the simulation result shows that a large boundary layer is broken by the duct and tabulator. Therefore, all the air molecules blew by the fan can be leveraged to carry the heat flux. The simulation result shows much improved performance with smaller fan requirement. This page shows the 18 kW transformer with a 3D printed optimized cooling duct for winding cooling. There are over 10 degree temperature improvement compared with the results without the duct. The fan can be reduced from the previous 120 mm 24 watt fan to just a 40 mm 3 watt fan. In this prototype, two transformers are put side by side and both are cooled effectively. The power density is over 560 watts per cubic inches, a big improvement compared with the commercial high frequency transformer solution. As a summary, this page shows the final converter prototype. The major components are labeled in the picture. The DC inductors are the surface mount type placed on the back side of the PCB boards. Due to the partial power processing solution, the DC inductors are very tiny and are almost negligible. The converter was tested up to 23 kilowatts peak power for a short period of time. For many automotive applications, if the water cooling can be applied, we expect even smaller size due to the cooling system size reduction, making this solution more appealing. We have seen several 650 volts, 750 volt class sitting carbon discrete MOSFETs, so it can be used on the low voltage battery side instead of the GAN device to consolidate the design for both input and output side. We believe there are still many optimization work to do to further drive the power density and the efficiency. So we look forward to the future collaborations with the industry partners. Finally, let me just take a minute to introduce you about CPS and Virginia Tech. We are working on a lot of power conversion technologies from devices to active and passive components and all the way to the system. We currently have 81 industry partners and members to access the CPAS IP portfolios and research outputs, including the work that I presented today. Last but not the least, I'd like to thank Power America and the team for the funding, partnership, and education support. Without it, we won't be able to assemble the team and put the work together. I also like to thank my colleague Rolando Burgess and the CPAS graduate and undergraduate students to work on the project. We also appreciate the teams from UTRC and Carrier for their industry collaboration and support during the project. Due to the time limit, many details cannot be discussed in this presentation, so I'll provide a list of publications here for your reference. Many detailed information from converter modeling control to converter design to transformer design, fabrication, and test can be found there. If you have any questions, you can also reach me by the email provided in this page. Thank you all for your attention today. Thank you, Dong. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. I particularly appreciated the uh, thermal management work that you talked about just now and how you were able to do some pretty clever uh, fluid dynamics and introduce those turbulators and as a result, reduce the uh, size of the, uh, the fan power. So that was uh, really great to see as a mechanical engineer. <laughs> uh, so with that, we're open to questions now. I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'd encourage you to submit any of your questions uh, right now for uh, Professor Dong while he's available. Okay, not seeing any. Do uh, you have any uh, final closing remarks? Have you had any follow-up with the folks at uh, Carrier since this project ended? Yes, I think we we yeah we work very well with the Carrier uh, colleagues during this uh, Power America uh, project, and um, uh, at the end of the project, we actually delivered the prototype to their site. And they also showcase these uh, technologies with, uh, within the companies during their 
annual CTO summit. So I think um, it's a very successful programs. And uh, also, you know, the programs suffer from the, the pandemic during the 2020, but we, we managed to handle all the challenges and uh, finish the projects on time. Um, um, still, I, I, I personally see a, a lot of uh, improvements, optimizations in terms of the converter topology controls and transformer designs. So I'm really looking forward to the future uh, on, uh, continuous the research and the collaborations with Power America and also industry partners. Thank you. I have one question here. Uh, what is the power supply efficiency in the backward direction? Oh, okay. So uh, in this presentation, we didn't really show the, uh, uh, the testing results when the, the uh, full bridge converter provides a negative output voltage. But in the, in the paper we published in the, in the journal, uh, we have all the results over there. So you can look at uh, the detailed uh, efficiency and uh, operation test results showing that it can operate uh, with a large uh, range of the battery voltage. The efficiency will be lower because uh, when the full bridge converter deliver negative output voltage, that means you have some circulating power uh, transferred from the main power branch to the uh, low voltage power power branch uh, within the converter, which actually not delivered to the, uh, to the battery side. But that uh, condition happened at a very low voltage uh, range. And typically for the battery systems at a very low voltage range, uh, you will reduce the power profiles. So you typically will now run at the full power condition. So in that case, uh, the efficient reduction can be uh, compensated by these uh, uh, battery operation profiles. But that's a very good question, yes. Thank you. Next question. What is the, uh, can the switching frequency of CLLC be increased further? And does it lead to EMI or EMC issues? Yeah, I think this is also a, a, a good question. Um, I think this really, really related to the, the cooling systems and also your size or power density target. We really try very aggressively in this project running 500 kilohertz with almost 23 kilowatts power uh, conditions. Uh, definitely we can improve the switching frequency to even close to megahertz. However, uh, the availability of the lease wire and to handle such a very high current gonna be very challenging. Also the PSB board design, running uh, one megahertz, uh, you know, huge current also gonna be a big challenge. So we, we can increase the uh, switching frequency, but uh, you need to look at the, the thermal performance and also the uh, practical, you know, if it's really practical, uh, you know, applied for high power uh, conditions. But we see megahertz transformer apply in you know, several kilowatts uh, uh, conditions using the PCB design. Excellent, thank you. Any final questions before we wrap up? Okay, we have one more question. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to, okay. Is it possible to build a CLLC converter with higher conversion ratio? say from 700 volt DC to 50 volt DC and back? Uh, sorry, can, can you repeat the question again, Rogoli? Is it possible to build a CLLC converter with higher conversion ratio, say from 700 volts DC to 50 volts DC and back? Uh, yes, uh, CLLC converter, you can design any uh, uh, turn ratios. Uh, it's com completely determined by the transform transformer turn ratio. And as I said, uh, the best way to operate the CLC converter is to fix the switching frequency at the resonant point because you can fully optimize the transformer and you don't need to put an AC inductor and the efficiency can be maintained pretty well. Uh, voltage ratio wise, yes, you have a big flexibility to design and it's completely determined by the transformer turn ratio. Thank you. What kind of MCU and model did you use for implement for implementation process of your project? 
yes, um, it's a good question. So in this project, we originally plan to design our own small uh, digital controller platforms onto this uh, PCB board. However, due to the, the limited time, we just directly adopt this uh, TI-DSP control card. And uh, it, it's a vertical small uh, daughter card we plug onto this, uh, uh, the receiving side of the PCB. And then that controller basically uh, create all the gating signals and uh, including the sensing and the measurement. So it's a DSP control platform, yeah. Okay, thank you. What aspects of your design do you think you could improve on given more time and resources potentially? I think the major piece is still on the transformer side. Uh, so I, I think for example, for automotive applications, if we can use the water cooling solution, uh, I believe we can further uh, shrink the size of the transformer. I, I think that's the key uh, piece for these entire uh, converters. Uh, converter wise, yeah, I, I think you can definitely improve it by using the best devices. And uh, you, know, you can just uh, look at the number of devices, switching frequencies to optimize it. But I think the, the key piece is still the transformer. And I think we have a opportunity to further uh, improve it. Thank you. What type of current sensors did you use and were they shunts? Um, because the only sensor we need is the DC uh, output current sensor. We use, uh, I, I believe it's a whole type uh, PCB mount uh, uh, sensor IC. And uh, it's very small IC and uh, we just put onto the PCB to do the, the measurement. And the uh, sensor itself provide the uh, galvanic isolation. So we don't need to worry about uh, insulation and isolation, that type of stuff. Thank you. And you may have answered this already, but what type of controller is used in this research? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a TITSP control card, but I think we can use some low end uh, 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 microcontrollers like a 8 bit or a 16 bit microcontroller. But uh, due to the limited time, we, we didn't develop this control <laughs> Uh, I, uh, controllers for the project, we just used the control card directly from uh, TI. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's the end of the questions. And so once again, I'd like to thank you, Dong, for your time and preparation for today. I think we had a really good participation, some great uh, questions at the end. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, Hopefully most of you can join us, uh, at least members at our upcoming Wide Band Gap Summer Workshop in uh, August here in Raleigh, North Carolina. So look out for uh, an invitation to that. So thanks again and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Rogolio. Thank you for everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day, everybody.